اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد. يون ذا اير هو نيفر. الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين. So inshallah ta'ala we'll continue where we left off last week and we were starting the chapter in which al-Imam al-Mujaddid he said من الشرك لبس الحلقة والخيط ونحوهما لرفع البلاء أو دفعه so he said, chapter, wearing a ring, twine, or something similar to relieve some affliction or repel it is an act of shirk. And what we did last week is we focused on the principle that governs this chapter and about 10 or 11 chapters that follow it. Happy, these are the handouts for the day. Alright, so we talked about that principle and what we'll do is we'll just revisit it briefly to make sure that it's fresh in our mind because that way it'll make this chapter and the subsequent chapters easy to understand. So does anybody remember the principle we discussed? You don't have to remember the exact wording, but do you remember the principle in general that we discussed last week? We spent the whole class discussing that principle. Does anybody remember? Remember that principle that governed, governs this chapter that we're going to take today and the following 10 or 11 chapters. And again, you don't have to memorize it, the wording of it. Just give me the meanings. Summarize it in your own words. Huh? Because remember we're talking about how people will think that this thing is a cause for benefit it's a cause for harm or repels harm. And we said that the causes come from who? Allah. And they're governed by Allah's will. And that's part of his what? Rububiyya. That's part of his lordship, right? One of his actions that is specific to him is making something a cause for something else. Is that right? So if we think something is a cause to bring about benefit, procure benefit, or repel, or prevent harm, and that's not the case, then that would be an act of what? Shirk in Rububiyyah, right? Because basically what we're doing is one of two things. Either we're saying that there's something that can produce, that can have a cause and effect relationship in spite of Allah, independent of Allah, right? Independent of His will. And that would be what? Making a rival to Allah. And that would be what? Obviously an act of shirk, right? Or we're saying that, that this thing is a cause, even though Allah didn't make it a cause. And that would also be what? Making what? Making a rival with Allah. That something basically is a cause without Allah making it a cause. You follow me, Ikhwan? So basically the principle is this. That if we think that something is a cause for something else, and we can't support that either with the shara, meaning a delil from the Quran or the hadith, and we can't support it with clinical tests, like the certain, certain medicines that people consume to relieve a headache or relieve some other, treat some other illness. And they've clinically tested it. If we can't prove it from any one of those angles, and there's no clear connection, link, between the cause and the effect, then that's an act of what? An act of shirk, right? And we need to understand that because many people, they fall into shirk in this area because they don't understand this what? This principle, okay? And that's the principle that governs what? This chapter that we're going to take and the subsequent chapters, okay? So, if you look on the handout, the first bullet point is what degree of shirk? So notice, the Imam al-Mujaddid, he said, wearing a ring, twine, or something similar to relieve some affliction or repel it is an act of shirk, but he doesn't say what? Shirk akbar, doesn't say shirk asghar, he just says what? Shirk atlaq. He just what? He said it generally in unrestricted fashion, didn't specify. It's unqualified, right? And the reason why he did that, Yahwani, wa is that it depends 
there's different degrees of shirk, and the degree of shirk that the person is guilty of is going to depend on what? Depend on his what? His i'tiqad, his belief. It's going to depend on his belief. So if he believed that the object can produce a desired result or prevent an undesired one, independent of Allah, in spite of Allah's will, that would be what? Shirk Akbar. It would be Shirk Akbar, would be the, my, the major Shirk, right? Fight. And if he believed that it creates the desired result, prevents some undesired result, but it does it by Allah's will. It does it by Allah's will. Allah made it a cause, but that's not really the case. He thinks that, but it's not the case. That would be shirk what? Ashar. Shirk ashar. That's why he just, the Imam just said shirk, because the ultimate ruling on which type of shirk is going to depend on what? Depend on whether it's what? Whether he believed it was independent of Allah or it was by Allah's, by Allah's will. Mumtaz. Tayyip. So then he said to relieve some affliction or repel it. Relieve means what? After it has occurred. So he uses this khayt, he uses this twine, he uses this halqa, this ring, he uses whatever, something like that, to repel harm after what? After it has what? I'm sorry, to um, relieve harm, relieve some affliction after it has occurred. Or what? To repel it, which means what? Before it occurs, he what? He uses this thing to what? To push it away, to prevent it from happening. Okay? And so what this tells us is that, look, it doesn't matter regardless of the circumstances and the motive. I'm trying to repel. I'm trying to relieve. Either case, he's going to be guilty of what? Some degree of shirk. So it, it doesn't matter if it's done before the affliction or after the affliction. It's going to be what? Shirk. That's what the Imam is telling us. So the person is going to be guilty of shirk if he takes what? If he takes this cause, which Allah didn't make a cause, whether he does it before the affliction or after the affliction, he's going to be guilty of what? A shirk. Then after that, the author cites what? How many proofs? How many proofs does he give to support his chapter title? Four proofs. One ayah and three ahadith. Okay? So let's take those one by one, and we'll comment on those one by one. So the first thing he brings is the ayah from Surah Al-Zumar, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, قُلْ أَفَرَأَيْتُمْ مَا تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ أَرَادَنِي اللَّهُ بِذُرٍ هَلْ هُنَّ كَاشِفَةُ ضُرِّهِ أَوْ أَرَادَنِي بِرَحْمَةٍ هَلْ هُنَّ مُمْسِكَاتُ رَحْمَةٍ قُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ يَتَوَكَّلْ يَتَوَكَّلْ مُتَوَكِّلُونَ So he says, Say, tell me then, the things that you invoke besides Allah. If Allah intended some harm for me, could they remove his harm? Or if he intended some mercy for me, could they withhold his mercy? Say, sufficient for me is Allah. On him must those who trust rely. Tayyip, how does this verse support the chapter heading? It supports it because the Imam or the, the, the ayah, basically, what is it saying? It says that Allah, I'm sorry, nothing besides Allah benefits or harms independently. It gives us this basic premise. Nothing besides Allah can benefit you or harm you independently. So whoever believes that an object can benefit or harm independently has what? Has erred, has done something wrong, has believed and acted incorrectly. Why? Because Allah is telling us clearly here that what? This is an error. And upon Allah must the people put their trust. Not upon what? These objects. You follow me? Like, what type of error? Does the ayah specify? Does the ayah say it's what? It's shirk, it's kufr, it's a major sin, it's a minor sin. Does the ayah specify? No, the ayah doesn't specify. The ayah just tells us what? It's an error. The person has done something what? Done something wrong. They have erred. So where does the proof that it's what? Shirk, where does that come from? It comes from the other nusus, the other proof text, which he's going to bring now. The Sheikh's going to bring some of them. You guys follow me? So at this stage from the ayah, we know that it's an error to believe that something can benefit you or prevent you from being harmed independently. We know this from the ayah, right? And that 
upon Allah must people rely. Got it? Mumtaz. طيب ثم بعد ذلك we come with what? We come to the hadith. The hadith of Imran. And in that hadith he says, أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم رأى رجلا في يده حلقة من سفر فقال ما هذه؟ قال من الواهنة فقال انزعها فإنها لا تزيدك إلا وحلا فإنك لو مت وهي عليك ما أفلحت ما أفلحت أبدا طيب So this hadith, what does it say? It says the Prophet once saw a man wearing a brass ring on his upper arm, like in this area, right? Right around the, the muscle area, close to the shoulder, okay? He's wearing this brass ring, or if you want a brass bracelet, I guess, because that's what you wear in your arm, let's, let's call it, or a band, we could say. So he's wearing this on his upper arm, and the Prophet saw it and he asked him, Mahadihi, what's this? And the man replied, Min al -wahina. From al wahina literally weakness, and we're going to specify what that means. Whereupon the Prophet said, remove it, it can only add to your weakness. Should you die while wearing it, it would never you would never succeed. طيب. So let's dissect this hadith. Okay, and see how this hadith answers the question that we have from the ayah. The ayah tells us an error, but it doesn't tell us what type of error. The hadith start to answer that question. So this hadith of Imran, notice, what did, the what did the first thing the Prophet do? When he saw this guy wearing this band, what did he do? What did the Prophet do? Did he snatch it off? Didn't snatch it off. Okay, did he tell him to remove it? No, not at first, did he? What did he do? He said, what is this? what's this? Istafham. Istafham, He what? He asked for clarity and asked to what? To investigate. To find out what was the man's reasoning behind what? Behind wearing the brass ring or the brass band on his arm. And why do you think the Prophet did that? Why do you think he, why didn't he just snatch it off? Or just tell him to remove it? Why do you think he asked him? That's a possibility because one of the best teaching methods is to ask questions because what that does is it makes people what? Pay attention. So that could be a reason that he wanted him to, he wanted to teach him, and he wanted to ask him. What's another possibility why the Prophet asked? What do you think? Hmm. Yeah, he wanted to know why, or what was his reason, his basis, why? Because he might have a good reason for doing it. Ahsant, and that's important. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So basically, if a person wears a brass band or a brass ring, he could wear it for what? That might be it. That might be it. So he looks bigger, right? So he looks bigger. Yeah, he puts a band, puts a band on the lower part of it, puts a band on the upper part of it, makes what? Makes him look more muscular. That might be it. Might have, might have an injury, like a real injury, that he's like treating the injury with, that, that's possible, okay. He could also be doing it for what? A zina. Adornment. It's like a fashion statement. It could be a fashion statement, right? But he could also be doing it because, like, because what? He feels like it's something that can protect him from some harm or repel some affliction. Both of those are possible. So because both of them are possible, the action that he's doing, as they say, it, it basically could be interpreted in two or more ways, or you could understand from it two or more different things. The Prophet didn't do what? He didn't assume. He didn't jump to conclusions. Rather, he gave the man the benefit of the doubt, and he asked. And this is a, the, the Prophet is teaching us indirectly how we need to conduct ourselves with other for the Muslims. And this is a big problem when it comes to what? The conservatives. When it comes to the religious people. And we all want to be from the religious people. We all want to be from the conservatives, the traditionalists, the people who follow what the Prophet brought. 
But one of the negative side effects is that is that sometimes the conservatives have a tendency to want to jump to conclusions and to assume the worst and then to do what? To attack. They're very they can be judgmental. Is that not so? So we have to understand the Prophet is teaching us in this hadith and many other hadith that whenever we see a Muslim do an action, and that action could be interpreted in more than one way, we're supposed to give that Muslim the benefit of the doubt. And we should inquire what the meaning is, what they intend. And then our response will be what? Accordingly. I'll give you an example. You go to Walmart and you go around uh, the 31st of October. Okay, what happens on the 31st of October? Ahsan. Well, there's some sales. There's a question. And one of the big sales is on what? Candy. Right? Because of Halloween, right? Also, a lot of sales on squash, pumpkins, stuff like that. Is that so? Because that's, that's a big thing for that season. So you go to Walmart, you go over to a Muslim, and you see in their cart they have what? Bags of candy. Bags of candy. Bunch of candy. Gangs of candy. Loads of candy. And they have some pumpkins in there, too. Right? Now... This action that they're doing, it, what? it could have more than one interpretation, right? Candy's on sale. I'm seizing the opportunity to get this candy because my children love candy, right? Has nothing to do with Halloween whatsoever. And pumpkins are on sale. I like to make what? Pumpkin pie. Or I like to make dishes with squash. And so I'm getting the pumpkin. And also, the prophet loved pumpkin. Play. That could be a possibility. The other possibility could be what? Gonna celebrate Halloween. Gonna pass out candy. Gonna cut out one of these pumpkins and make, you know, a uh, what do they call those things? Huh? Jacqueline. I sent. So that's a possibility. So if we see this, we shouldn't do what? We shouldn't assume. Jump to conclusion and start saying, "Oh, you can't celebrate Halloween. Halloween's haram, mm -hmm. right? Halloween's haram." This and the other. We just jump to a conclusion. Left. That's tafsir, right? We ask. We ask. We inquire. If we feel like we need to do that, and we might be surprised by the by the response. While I have this, and use this as an analogy, make an analogy between this and any other thing. When you meet a Muslim, you see a Muslim, they do something that has more than one interpretation. Don't assume the worst. Give them the benefit of the doubt. And if you need to, ask, but don't jump to conclusions. Mumtaz. So the hadith goes on, and he says, min al wahina. The band says min al wahina. And wahina, it's based on the illness that occurs in the shoulder or the upper arm. So it is as if the man said, I'm wearing this on Rasulullah to prevent the illness of Al-Wahina or to cure the illness of Al-Wahina. I'm wearing it for one of these two reasons. Either I'm, I'm afflicted by it and I want to cure it, or I'm afraid I'll be afflicted by it, so I'm trying to what, repel it. So when he said that, that's when the Prophet said, what? In Remove it. Get rid of it. Because it can only add to your weakness. Should you die while wearing it, you would never succeed. So when the Prophet says remove it, we automatically know it's what? Haram. It's haram. It's haram mutlaqan, absolutely. La, it's haram if you wear it with that intention. Right? You, it's haram if you wear it with that intention. Why? Because it was haram mutlaqan. If it was haram absolutely, the Prophet would have what? He would have prohibited him from the beginning. Ahsan Habib. He would have prohibited him from the beginning. So the Prophet asked him, when he made it clear that he had that intention, the Prophet said, okay, you need to take it off. You take it off, right? So that's the first thing. It's prohibited to wear with that intention. Then he said, if you die and you have it on you, ma'aflahd, you won't succeed. So that's telling us that's what? It's not only haram, it's a type of what? Shirk or kufr. Kufr, shirk, something which takes you out of the deen. Because the sharia, it won't tell you that you won't succeed unless you what? Unless you commit disbelief, right? Everybody has a chance to succeed as long as they don't want disbelief and commit shirk. So when the Prophet said, Ma you won't succeed, well, that lets us know, hey, this is a serious offense that can what? That can deny you success. Right? It's not just an, any ordinary sin. It's what? It's an act of disbelief. طيب. So the tahreem, the prohibition comes from what? In zi'ha. Remove it. We know it's prohibited with that intention. And then when he said, Ma but then we know it's what? It's an act of shirk. A couple of notes about this hadith. Number one, he said it will increase you in weakness. But how can it increase you in weakness when it's not what? It's not a, a legitimate cause. It's not really a cause, but he says it can increase you in weakness, as if it can't have an effect. 
So the answer to that is what? The scholars of Islam had two opinions. One is that they said that basically this is an example of a person being punished by Allah with the opposite of what they intended to achieve. Right? So he wanted to get what? Cured. And Allah does what? Increases him in weakness as a punishment. So they say what they call in Arabic, we say, Mu'amad al-insan bin aqidi qasti. Giving the person the opposite of what he want, hoped to achieve. That's one interpretation. The second interpretation is that when a person takes these objects, these different things, a talisman this, an amulet that, and he takes these different things that he wants, he thinks will protect him, and he puts his trust in them and set up Allah, he'll be afflicted all the time with what? These like this anxiety and this worry and this concern about, oh, I'm going to be afflicted by this, I'll be afflicted by that. And so he becomes what? He be, his mental health, his psychological health will be what? Will be affected by that. That constant worry and anxiety that I'm going to be afflicted by this, I might be afflicted by that, I'll have to protect myself from this, I'll have to protect myself from that. So this does what? It weakens him. Right? You guys see that? So the effect that it has from him putting his trust in everything but Allah is that what? He becomes weak and uncertain and also anxious and worried. Well, the, the second note is that in the points, the Imam, after he gives the chapter and all of his adilla, he gives some beneficial points at the end of the chapter. And one of the beneficial points he said in this, in this, in this particular chapter, he said, أَنَّهُ لَمْ يُؤْضَرْ بِالْجَحَالَ That the man was not excused due, due to his ignorance. He wasn't excused due to his ignorance. He wasn't pardoned by the messenger due to his ignorance. And so the question comes, does this mean that the Imam does not consider ignorance an excuse for those who commit shirk and other sins? And the answer is no. That's not what the Imam intends. Why? Because we have too many evidence from the Quran and Hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the udhr, he accepts the excuse of what? Jahala. He accepts, accepts the excuse of Ignorance, and he'll pardon people because of their ignorance. So, for example, he said in the Quran, he said, "Wa kunna mu'adibina hatta never at Rasula." He said, "We're not going to punish anyone until we what? We send a messenger until they they get informed by the messenger." And he said in the other ayah, "Wa ma yushaqi al Rasul min ba'di ma tabayyin lahu al Huda, wa yatabi ghira sabil mu'minin." So he said in this ayah, the last ayah, he said, "And those." who contradict and oppose the messenger after the truth has become clear to them. I'm sorry, clear to him. We will entrust him to that which he has chosen or he's followed. And we will burn him in hell. And what an evil destination it is. But pay attention now. He said, After the guidance has become clear to him. Meaning, he won't punish him if the guidance hasn't become what? hasn't become clear to him. Only once it's become clear to him and he chooses, well, you know, he basically on his own volition chooses what? The wrong path. And there are many ayat like this and many hadith which indicate that what? The person will be excused for what? They're ignorant. So that's not what the Imam is saying. So what is he saying? Well, I want you to pay attention to something, Yahwani. When we talk about al-udhar, we talk about excuses and excusing someone for ignorance, there are two types of excuses or two instances where we excuse a person or a person can be excused. They could be excused, or two things, let me say this, two things they could be excused from. They could be excused from what? Al-Ithm wal uquba Excused from sin and the punishment which comes as a, content, as a consequence of sin. And this is what Allah talks about in the Quran, and the Prophet talks about the Hadith. That's the other that they talk about. A person will be excused from sin and the punishment or the consequence that comes from what? Sin. The second excuse is excuse from what? Al-Inkar. Excuse from what? Being reproached, being censured, being told that, hey, this is wrong, being corrected. Al-Inkar. And this is the excuse, wa alaykum salam. This is the excuse that even if a person is ignorant, he won't what? He won't be entitled to this excuse. You guys follow me? So basically, everyone gets what? Everyone gets corrected and told that what? They're mistaken, even if they're what? Ignorant. You guys follow me? So when the Imam said that he was not excused for his ignorance, I'm sorry, he was not excused for his ignorance, which excuse is he talking about? Excuse from sin and punishment? 
That's not the one he's talking about. He's talking about excuse from what? al inkar being told this is wrong and corrected. So the Prophet didn't what? Didn't punish him, didn't curse him, didn't tell him he's going to go to hell, right? But the Prophet did what? Tell him that what? Remove this. You have to take it off. It's wrong what you're doing. And this is what? This is the consequence of what you're doing. So he corrected him, but he didn't what? Didn't punish him. You guys follow me? So when the Imam says that he wasn't excused due to his ignorance, it means what? He wasn't excused from what? Al-Inkar, being what? Corrected. So when people do wrong, they can expect not to be told, hey, this is the wrong thing, because they're ignorant. No, they have to be told. Everyone has to be what? Told the right thing and told if they're doing something wrong. Does that make sense? You guys look a little confused. It makes sense or no? You want to revisit it? Sisters, is it clear or we revisit it? Should we say it again? Like, all right, the Imam in his Masa'al, in his beneficial points, he said, that the man wasn't excused for his ignorance. So then a person might say, okay, well, does that mean that if you do something wrong and you're ignorant, you won't be pardoned? By Allah, that you'll be held accountable. Ignorance is not an excuse or a legitimate excuse not to be what? Punished. You guys follow me? It's kind of like, let's say that you were driving on the road and the police pulled you over. And they said, you know why I pulled you over? No, I have no clue. I was, you know, adhering to the speed limit. Says your tail light is out. Says I didn't know. Is he going to excuse you for that? the fact that you didn't know your tail light is out? No. no. He's going to give you a ticket. Whether you know or don't, that's not an excuse. Your tail is out, it's an offense. Here you go, take this citation, right? In Islam, Allah says no. When people don't know the ruling, they don't know that they're doing something wrong, they'll be what? Pardoned until what? Until they know. Allah says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبَعْتَ رَسُولًا And we're not going to punish people until what? Until we appoint a messenger, until we send a messenger to tell them that what? What they're doing is wrong. And the Imam believes that. He accepts that to the point that he says in one of his books, and I want to say it's Kashf um, al-Shubuhat, he says in that book that I don't declare the people who worship the idol which is erected over the grave of, the, of Abdul Qadir al-Jalani, I don't consider them to be disbelievers because there's no one to what? To inform them. They don't know any better. He excused them because of what? Because of their ignorance. And they were committing what? A shirk al-Akbar. So the Imam doesn't believe that. So then the person says, well, what is he trying to say then? Because he points out that the person wasn't excused for his ignorance. So we say there's two types of excuses. There's excuses, a person being excused from sin and the punishment that comes as a consequence of sin. Okay? And this is something which Islam what? Islam grants. Grants as an excuse. Allah applies it. The Prophet applied it in the Hadith. And we believe in it. We accept it. The second type of excuse is a person being excused from what? An inkar, being told that he's mistaken, that he's wrong, being informed that this is the, this is the wrong thing you're doing and this is the correct thing that you should do. <clears throat> so now this excuse, Islam doesn't want advocate. Islam doesn't excuse anyone from being told that they're wrong just because they are ignorant. You guys follow that? Make sense now? So that's what the Imam says, that's what he means when he says he was not excused for his ignorance. Excused from what? From being told, hey, this is wrong, this is the right thing, this is what you need to do. While they're having caught. Play. Alright, then by that, uh, we go to the hadith number two, which is the hadith of Uqba ibn Amr, in which he says, whoever wears a talisman or an amulet, may Allah not fulfill his wish. And whoever hangs a seashell, May Allah not grant him peace and rest. And from here we learn that wearing amulets and hanging seashells for good luck or protection from evil is prohibited. Why? Because the Prophet made dua against the one who does so. And the Prophet would never make dua against anyone unless they what? Unless they abandoned something obligatory, they left off something obligatory, or they committed what? committed a great sin. Well, 
So when the Prophet makes dua against someone, we know that what? They did something what? Heinous. They did something heinous. So the Prophet is telling us in this hadith, or this verse of the hadith, that they're doing something heinous. But does he specify that what it is? Is it kufr? Is it a major sin? Is it shirk? He doesn't specify. Where does the specific speci specificity, where does that come from? The specification, where does that come from? It comes from the next version of the hadith. So the hadith has more than one version, more than one riwayah. So in the next riwayah, he said, Man faqad ashrak. Whoever wears an amulet has committed a shirk. So now we know that what is the heinous crime he committed? He committed what? A shirk. And the level of shirk, the degree of it, is going to depend on his belief. All right? And why are they a form of shirk? Why are these amulets a form of shirk? Because the person considers them to be a cause for repelling harm or bringing about some benefit, although what? Allah has not made them so. And we said that anybody who does that is guilty of what? A shirk. Any questions about that hadith? Hadith number two. Any questions, Ya Khwan? Akhwat, any questions? That clear? Tafadal, Sofri, huh? Tafadal. In regards to the hand of the seashells. Uh huh. Okay, suppose one has a seashells that are for decorative purposes or for the wind to blow and you hear the sound. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Again, this would be based upon his intention. Eh. That someone could see this and use that as a, or to interpret and jump eh. to the conclusion that eh. that he's hanging the seashell, so you should take this down. Mm. Well, again, we have two things. One that we talked about earlier, that anytime someone does something, and we have tamad ma'niyin, anytime someone does something and it has more than one meaning, then we go back to what? His interpretation, his intention. So we ask him. Because if he's hanging it for decoration, that's different than hanging it for what? As a talisman or an amulet. That's the first thing. The second thing is that a lot of this is all based upon what? Al-i'tiqat. It's based upon what? The mu'attaqit, what the person believes. So we said, for example, if you believe that it helped by Allah's will, it would be shirk askar. I'm sorry. If you believe it helps independently, shirk akbar. If he doesn't believe in what? I don't believe it helps or harms whether by Allah or independent of Allah. It's just what? Decoration. Then what? It would be what? Jazz. It would be permissible for decoration. Yeah. So when the Prophet talks about hanging seashells, he's talking about hanging them for what? With the intention of what? Bring about some benefit or propelling some some harm. So that would be the same as like, uh, some Christian wearing a cross, for example? No, the cross is prohibited. The cross is prohibited because it's a rep it's like a symbol of a shirk. Okay. Yeah, so that's right. different. That's right. totally different, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so we go to the next hadith, which is the hadith of Hudayfa. Right? Is that where we are? Number four. Yeah, number four. Number four, I'm sorry. So we, okay, so it is the four, the third hadith, but the fourth delil. Okay. And that's the hadith of Hudayfa in which he saw a man with a piece of twine on his hand to protect or cure him from al-humma, fever. So Hudayfa, he did what? He cut the twine and recited the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ And most of them believe not in Allah except that they associate partners with Him. Okay? All right, let me say a few things about this narration, and then we'll open up for general questions. It says, first of all, this hadith is not authentic. This hadith of Hudayfa is not authentic. But if it were, it would contain the tafsir of a companion, Hudayfa, of the verse in Surah Yusuf, and that it means, it would basically be conveying that it means that most of those who believe in Allah, the true believers, and we know, even though they believe in Allah's Tawheed, they commit minor shirk. Okay? And this is an accurate tafsir, even though the athar, this narration is what? It's not authentic, it's weak. This is an accurate tafsir. That many people who believe in Allah, they do what? They commit shirk ashar. They do. Whether it be arriya, whether it be... Um, taking these talismans, believing that they help them by Allah's permission, whatever it is, they commit shirk, ashar, okay? So that's the first interpretation of the ayah, and it's authentic, it's a correct interpretation, even though the ether of Hudayfa conveying that is not authentic. 
But there's another interpretation of the ayah, and that's the interpretation of Ibn Abbas and some of the early Muslims, Ba'd al-Salaf. And they said, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ Meaning that most of them don't believe in Allah's tawheed or tawheed Allah al-rububiyyah. Allah's lordship or rububiyyah Allah. They don't believe in Allah's lordship and he's talking about the pagans of Mecca. إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ Except that they associate partners with him, set up rivals with him, fi uluhiyatihi, in his what? In his right to be worshipped. So the pagans, they believed in what? Tawheed rububiyyah. But they committed shirk in what? Tawheed al-ibadah. And so that's the other possible meaning of this what? Of this text, or the other possible tafsir of this verse. And that will bring, inshallah ta'ala, the chapter to a close. And I think this is a good stopping point because the next chapter is a lengthy and the discussion, I won't say the chapter is lengthy, but the discussion of it is lengthy. So we'll stop here if you have any questions. Any questions? Any questions going once? I wonder where we are in the book. In the book. This is chapter, we just finished uh, the eighth chapter. The eighth chapter. And so we'll be in the ninth chapter. Yeah. Any other questions? So I'm trying to bring the notes, and this time the notes, they actually contained the chapter. So you could follow along with what was said and make any annotations. And we're going to keep trying to have a visual and not just have uh, an oral presentation. So I hope that's helpful. And again, your suggestions are welcome. It was actually someone's suggestion that we bring a visual. We're going to do a PowerPoint, but it's just too cumbersome. So we decided to do this. And I hope you find it helpful. And if you have any other suggestions, they're welcome. Because obviously it's about you, it's not about, um, it's not about me. Type anything else? Hmm. Any questions? Going once, going twice, going. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa barak on Nabi Muhammad. وفيك بارك يا شيخنا لا اله الا الله